Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering the Waybound bloopers and the Cradle series wrap up. In this episode, I'm going to read the bloopers live, and we're going to talk about Cradle as a whole, taking into account perhaps some questions and or comments from the audience. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Andy for commissioning this episode. You guys, I am so, so sad. (laughs) I'm really, really glad that I have a wrap up episode. Like, thank you, Andy, again, for really forcing me to hold my horses when I was about to refund the payment for the extra episode and being like, I think probably you could make it work with that extra episode because I didn't want to be out here ripping anybody off. And I'm also, as we have seen many times, very impatient. So, you know, I was, I really wanted to just like read faster, yada, yada. I just... I can't believe how much there is to talk about in only like 25 pages in these books. And I look back and part of me like, look, well, if you're out there, all I want you to do is say publicly that you support trans people. And like, that's it. That's it. Please do something that makes me feel like covering your shit with Rashawn is not an ethically ambiguous thing to do because I want to go back over this material so bad. I really, really do. And I am agonized every time I think about how close we were to doing it. And I just, you know, oh my God, please. That's all I want, Will. You're out here saying shit in DMs to people and that's all well and good, but I feel a way about the fact that you haven't been vocal on your platforms publicly. Just put your money where your mouth is. Just go ahead because I want to cover this. And I'm not trying to act like unspoiled is some major juggernaut of a social influencer. But I do think that more people would be checking out your books even than they are now if we covered it with Rashawn because she's such a draw. People love her as a co-host. So just truly, dude, please. It's not even just for me. Do it for your own conscience. Just go ahead, you know? That's it. So That's the last I'm going to say about that. But this series has been so much fun. The rereads that I have done on my own time have been so rewarding. And I can't believe this was just a side project for him. Like, it just makes me cackle to myself every time I think about the the fact that he was taking this world less seriously and somehow it just connected for everybody because obviously this is his most popular one, like by, by far. Right. So I, and I stand by the fact that it's the humor. So saying that let's get into the bloopers. Shall we, shall we just start it? Bloopers. Worst book in the series. Ethan declared. Lyndon shrugged. I don't know. I liked it. Lots of powering up. What's your criteria for a good book? Percentage of Ethan. The more lines I have, the better the book. This one didn't have nearly enough Ethan for my taste. You weren't in the first one either, Lyndon pointed out. Oh, but I was there in spirit. 
How do you read other books without you in it? I don't. Ethan held up a book with his own smiling face on it. There's only one other story worth reading. From Conditioner to Executioner, a story of hairspray and spraying blood. The Ethan Aurelia story, collected edition. <laughs> that sounds uh, fascinating. I'll have to get a copy one day. You have one. Check your pocket. A story of hair spray and spraying blood. Oh, God, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's some good shit. Okay, okay, okay. Next one. Next one. Do you have an answer for me? Lyndon asked. You're not going to like it, Dross said gravely. It should be a gun. Lyndon considered the silent strings the silent king the silent string lol, the silent king's binding really you don't think something else like a spear or a bow nope definitely a gun in fact they should all be guns why well a gun is the most efficient weapon it's just better in every single way also Raygon shen's going to be shaking when you pull up to the fight with the silent king assault rifle <laughs> It's interesting because uh, Dross didn't know the word gun, did he? Like, canonically, guns, bullets, what fun words I'm learning. Robots, I think was the other one. Um, all right. We're missing a name, Mercy cried. Dross drifted over. Oh, I've been thinking about this. It's a chamber where we distort time, right? And that change is very dramatic. So I thought we could call it, he spread boneless arms wide, the hyperbolic time ch No, Zeal interrupted. No one uses the word hyperbolic. You do better then. Zeal responded immediately, the danger room. I like that one, Lyndon said, but for some reason I get the feeling we shouldn't use it. Okay, guys, these are clearly references, but I don't know to what. Help me out, you nerds. Tell me. Help me out. Mercy leaped up. I like the room part. Let's go with that. What about the requirement room? No, wait, I'll think of something else. Oh, I see. I see what we're doing there. I got that one. We should say something about the way it functions, Lyndon said. But this is basically just a complex matrix of stolen constructs, and we wouldn't want to call it the Matrix. <laughs> Yaren patted the weapon at her waist. We're training swords in here, aren't we? How about the House of Blades? Zeal pointed to her. That's it! <laughs> I like it. Now he's, now he's copyright infringing himself. Uh, Andy says, time chamber is Dragon Ball. Oh, okay. I really, should I watch Dragon Ball, you guys? Owen talks about it all the time. Like, he's not a massive fan, exactly, but he watched it when he was a teen. And so it's like just part of his repertoire, you know? And uh, I think about the, like, there's got to be a lot of references in it or references in the world that I've sort of missed because they're from that show. Danger Room is X-Men. Really? What is the Danger Room in X-Men? Is that in the movies, in the comics, in both? I don't remember that one. Not that I have like a great knowledge of X-Men. It's just the sort of thing that like, I would think just my proximity to Owen because of he is definitely obsessed with the X-Men. I would think I would have absorbed that, you know, just by osmosis. Uh, Room of Requirements from Harry Potter. Yeah, that one I got. Um, all right. All right. Next one. Uh, it's like a hollow room, says Han Andy. Oh, so they have like holograms of f people that they're going to fight. Uh, like a projection to prepare. Holograph for transmitting communications it doesn't matter i'm just curious okay well next next one 
the weeping dragon was flying south over the trackless sea, following traces of its younger brother. It felt the remainder of the slumbering wraith's power, tracking it to a cloud fortress drifting over the ocean. As soon as the dread god got close enough to see the house on its dark blue cloud, suddenly it felt seven new figures emerge from within. Seven terrifying figures. Monarchs stronger than anything it had ever felt. At the sudden threat looming in the immediate future, the weeping dragon turned and ran. Meanwhile, Zeal turned to Linden. This worked a lot better than I thought it would. What do you mean? I told you when we came out here the weeping dragon would run from us. Yeah, I just, for some reason, I thought something would go wrong. Nope. Smooth sailing. Huh. <laughs> I like that, actually. Just the idea that they just completely, no problems, managed to get to their thing, and then what happens? You know what? I appreciate this, Will. This is Will being like, I'm just going to indulge for a second in the what ifs of our friends getting to do their plan. And as somebody who plans obsessively and gets very upset when things don't go according to plan, which leads to me being upset so much more often than you'd really think would be healthy for anybody. I would just like to say, I appreciate it, Will. I appreciate the treat of getting to see a plan that just goes well, even if it is a blooper. All right. <laughs> Next one. To Yaren, the world turned colorless and very, very quiet. She realized something new. She saw a pattern so clear that she was shocked she hadn't noticed it before. Yaren wasn't just the disciple of the Sage of the Endless Sword. She was also... <laughs> she was also Athan's apprentice, the student of the Reaper. She had used penance to strike down a monarch. She had learned to imitate Osriel's sword strike. In a world that still seemed frozen, Yaren pulled her sword back almost casually. An image formed in the sky at the motion, not a sword, a vast, smiling face with twinkling blue eyes. Die, Yaren ordered. At Yaren's command, the Athen icon descended on Akura Malice. You guys... First of all, the Athen icon. I what would he think of this? Of of his icon being of death. I feel like he'd be bummed. Like his face being Oh, this hurts my heart. I don't like this one. It's just too he I don't think he would like it. I think he'd be bummed. I really do. Also, I know that it's been mentioned before, so this should not be a surprise. But I do want to, like, register that I keep forgetting or not fully recognizing and processing the fact that icons have colors at all. Because when we're with Mercy and she manifests the joy icon, the flower is purple, if I am not mistaken. And I have been imagining the whole time, y'all, icons being, like, made out of cloud. I don't think I even realized I was imagining it. And the fact that the flower is purple, I just stuck to the side and was like, well, that's not important because that's not the icon. That's just what he's saying. But that we all know what they really look like. I think I just ignored his description straight up. And so I imagine it as like the clouds descending out of the stratosphere to form a, an icon temporarily that when you dismiss it, it sort of breaks into wisps of cloud and disappears. So that's what I've been thinking. And so the idea of there being a face with blue eyes, that's so creepy. Even if it were his face in cloud, it would bum me out, but I could accept it. But the sparkling blue eyes, that's what sends it over the edge for me. I don't like that blooper. I reject it. Okay, next one. 
Do you know anything about my father? Mercy asked. They told me enough, Lyndon said. They told me you killed him. Wrong! Mercy straightened up and raised a black-clad fist. You are my father! Lyndon staggered back, clutching a nearby pole for support. No, that's not true. That's impossible. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. No! Lyndon, join me, and together we can rule the world as father and daughter. Lyndon leaped off the cloud ship. Oh, God, that is a corny one. Oh man, you guys, all right, hold on. I'm going to I'm going to institute an out of 10 rating system. So we're going to go with uh the first one because I laughed so hard that I could barely finish it. We're giving that a perfect score, 10 out of 10. Perfect blooper, love it. Secondly, assault rifle. Due to the canonic complications with the fact that Jaws wouldn't even know what the word gun was and also that guns just suck. I'm going to put that one as a 4 out of 10. Didn't like it. The naming one, despite the fact that I didn't get some of the references, I appreciate what's being done here. I also always appreciate the references being embedded in the bloopers. I'm going to give this one a 7 out of 10. The Weeping Dragon one, due to the fact that it speaks to my particular need to see things go well for people sometimes, I'm going to give that a 9 out of 10. That's a very satisfying one for me. I understand that, you know, if you don't have my particular obsession with things like that, it might not hit, but that's just me. So for Athan's face, blue eyes, I'm going to give that one again because I reject it and it makes me sad for him. I'm giving that one a 3 out of 10. I don't like it because it feels like Ethan would not be happy about it. And I just, Ethan's worked really hard and tried to be better. And I think he deserves more. And then this one, the reference, I enjoy that. The performance of it, uh, I don't mean performance like my performance. I just mean like the way that it, it shakes out when you imagine it, it feels so goofy. It breaks even for me. I'm going to give that a five out of 10. How many more of them are there? Let me look here. Oh, this is the last one. Okay. Last one. Yaren clung to the edge of the cliff by the tips of her fingers. Lyndon peered down at her. What are you doing? He asked. Yaren shrugged as best she could while still hanging onto the cliff. Not sure. I hear we're supposed to end books this way. Not this one. Really? Yeah. This is the last book in the series. Oh my god, a cliffhanger. God, I am so mad right now. He reached out a hand to pull her up. Now we don't hang on to cliffs. We rest on flat, open, empty ground with nothing left to look forward to. And only an all-consuming sense of emptiness. <laughs> Yaren looked around her, seeing nothing. That sounds worse. It is worse. But hey, he clapped her on the shoulder. At least we're not hanging on a cliff. Oh God, that's a little bit too close. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. That hurt. So I'm taking a couple points off for that. But also, it was very correct. So I'm, I'm gonna give that one an eight out of ten. A nine, if I'm being nice. But an eight because I'm mad at, at Will now for that. So, yeah. Wow. Really, Will? <laughs> Christ. Oh, man. That is mean. He's just like, yeah, so uh, enjoy that existential crisis you're going to have now that the series is over. <laughs> Wow, what must it be like to have that power as an author, to get everybody hanging on your every word, and then it's over, and you know people are going to be so bummed that if you wrote literally anything in that same universe, they would just eat it up. Like, 
you know what I'm saying? Like there, that, that is power right there. That's amazing. And I love this for him. Good for him. Um, <laughs> oh, I went to the last page of this, the, the Kindle book. Want to always know what's going on with Will, we mean. The best way to stay current is to sign up for the Will White mailing list. Get book announcements and, well, that's pretty much it. No spam. Okay, sometimes we'll send an announcement about something that's only book related. Not a lot. Promise. Oh, I am going to go ahead and sign up for that literally right now. Here I go, kids. Are you ready? <laughs> Here I go. Um... All right. Well, yeah, those were pretty solid bloopers. I I did enjoy those. It must be so much fun to write those. If you guys could write a blooper for this book, is there a particular point that like stuck out to you as this would be an ideal time for a blooper to pop up? Because I know that while I was reading, there were a couple spots where I kind of felt like I, I would not be surprised if he wrote one that took place right at this moment. Uh, the one that I would have liked <laughs> is when Lyndon is unconscious and his arm is dragging him toward malice. I would really enjoy a blooper where he did just kill her right there. And it was like, everybody was unconscious for it. Nobody knew what had happened. And, you know, I'm assuming that her, uh, her remnant would peel off and that he, his arm would like eat that as well. I think would probably be how it would work. But, uh, it would be kind of funny if like he just killed and ate her, consumed her completely while unconscious and nobody knew what happened to her. And they woke up and it was just like malice was just gone. And, for whatever senses he uses, like spiritual senses, he could feel that she was no longer on the planet, but nobody knew what happened. The, I guess Dross would know because he's still like, it, he is aware enough of what Lyndon was doing when he was unconscious that he can tell him afterwards about all the people that he attacked. And he was the one who managed to get, uh, is it Larian? Because she, he attacked her more than once, right? And Dross like drove her off. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I just really like that idea that uh, he, the idea of of killing her when literally everybody of consequence is out for the count, and then nobody knows what happens, and maybe they assume that she ascended, and they ascend looking for her, and she's not there either, and they all just are like. I don't know what could have happened to her. Um, <laughs> Asher is in the chat. I would have loved a blooper of that moment where Lyndon has mercy in his arms and he says, my precious. I don't. When does he have her in his arms? Is that when when does that happen? I don't even remember Asher. <laughs> but again, I like it whenever there's a reference. So I'm here for that for sure. Um, so I had said in the last episode, the last recording that I did, that if anybody had questions that they wanted me to answer or that if they had like supplementary info that they wanted to share to post it in the discord, but there's nothing in there. So nobody asked any questions. Nobody shared any further like info. Um, and it didn't occur to me until literally today that I could have gone and looked myself because I am spoiled now. And so that's fair game. But I'm so used to having to avoid all, you know, content outside of the book I'm covering that I didn't even think to do it. So what I'm going to do here is kind of like ask you guys some questions and also answer them myself because it's going to be a lot of like sort of opinion stuff. Um, Asher says that moment facing Malice when Malice tried to hide Mercy in her void space. Oh, got you. And he punches a hole and drags her out. Okay. And then he says my precious when he takes her back. I like it. All right. Now, that ties in well with mine. I like this, Asher. We've got a whole scene. I say we write it. Let's do it. 
Um, okay, so one of the things that you guys know I have been like spitballing about is who I would like to see more of. Like if I had my druthers and we either got an additional book with like other POVs or we had the same books, but we added some different POVs. It's like, really, I think what I would have to do if I'm thinking about the structure of the books, they would have to be additional ancillary materials because adding extra stuff into the book itself would probably give things away because there's a lot of like little sort of mysteries wrapped up in the story and you know information about how the world works that doesn't get revealed right away so if you don't want to share all of that then you have to put it somewhere and i think that's like i i i think it would have to be separate because if you want to give people extra background but you don't want them to know what somebody's goal has been that's a tricky thing to pull off and so for me i really really want more of emrys silentborn i want like a lot more about what it's like to be a remnant that like manages to regain enough vitality to basically be a fully alive being again that could uh, once again manifest a remnant I, I just want to know how that works secondly i want to know how emrys figured out about the hunger madra and the connection to the dread gods and the monarchs and it, like the way that she tracked it all down and i would love to see all of the things that she has likely done in her life to work against the monarchs that they didn't know about. Cause I don't believe for one second that working with Lyndon is the first time that she ever like worked overtly against them. I'm sure she's been doing all kinds of shit on her own. And this for me, I would just be fascinated not only in like her life, but the people that she has mentored and the like, the fact that she is a tree, basically, what are her people like? How how does that work? You know, um, I'm I just have a lot of questions about her entire race. So yeah, Emrys is somebody I would love more info on. Oh, Andy says, this has been a satisfying journey for me. I remember sponsoring the first book and being very concerned you wouldn't enjoy it. That's right. Andy commissioned the first book and basically was like, I'm going to like, see how you feel about it. And if you like it, I'll commission the rest of the books. But he wasn't going like, he didn't want to risk it, understandably, because I mean, that's a big commitment. And as somebody who did get commissioned to start a book series that I did not like, I know that it's not fun for the person who commissioned it, nor is it fun for me to talk week after week about a series that I don't like or a character that I don't like. Um, and for those interested, it was the Iron Druid series, which uh, has been recommended to me a lot by people who are like, if you finish Dresden and you want more of something that is like Dresden Files the Iron Druid series is, has a very similar energy. And while it does have a similar energy, it's like similar in all of the worst ways. And it's, it's, it's just very bro -y. And the main character who is supposedly like a thousand years old feels like he's 17 in his maturity level and attitude about everything. Just the whole vibe of the first book I don't think it even got commissioned all the way to the end because I was like part way through it and just like, I just hate this guy. I do not like him and everything that he chooses to do. I'm like, why would you handle it this way? The magic was cool. And you know, the bringing in of certain like beings was, uh, was well done. I, I liked the concept, but the characterization, it was so childish to me. So anyway, you are right, Andy, to be cautious about it. And I do remember my concern when I first started was the Abaddon stuff left me cold. 
I could not follow it. It felt like very confusing as to the names of the beings and what their roles were and why I should care about this. Like once Surreal finally descends and gets involved with Lyndon, it clarified a little bit, but it takes a bit for that to happen. And then she leaves and it feels very separate from him again. And so I had a really hard time with that. And that part is certainly a lot more rewarding on a reread, but I, I stand by that. It's probably the least elegantly done of everything because I, when I reread, all I can think was, how would this have made any sense without the context of what I know now? And, uh, I don't really know how to do that better. So I don't have suggestions, but I do know that it was the, the hardest part for me. The part that clicked the best was not only like the magical system, which um, I understood to, you know, be like chi and meridians and all of the way that functioned. But I also really liked the fact that Lyndon was a cheater and he was treated like somebody with a really, a really debilitating disability. And the fact that he just decided, well, fuck you guys. Why do I have to follow the rules when the rules are designed to work against people like me? That really connected with me right away. I loved that. And the fact that he was out here just breaking rules I was struggling with because I'm a rule follower. And it was hard for me to like hold in my head that he is the hero of the story, clearly, but also somebody who doesn't care about the rules that's set in place by his society or by the like competitions that he enters, things like that. Um, Ooh, Asher says Fisher Gesha for people you want more of. I want just 1000 words of her thinking about Lyndon's parents or bitching about Lyndon being out and about doing crazy things and not checking in with her often enough, but not as much as I want her thinking about his parents with scorn. Asher, Amen. I love that very much. Just the whole idea of Fisher Gesha being out here, like, because Lyndon's parents, I had wondered how they were treated, and it's clear that they're treated like celebrities, basically. But I would love to see Fisher Gesha showing them total disrespect and everybody around her being kind of shocked by it because they don't get where that's coming from. And we know that she just views them as failures of parents. And I just think it would be really funny considering how over the top she is a lot of the time when dealing with people of higher power levels or just, and when I say higher power levels, I don't even just mean like in terms of advancement, you know what I'm talking about. She like prostrated herself in front of eighth and trembling the first time that she met him. Um, I really like the idea of getting to see that attitude foiled with his parents and how much she just holds them in total contempt. So Asher hard agree. Um, Ooh, Megan says there's a short story from zeal's POV that I really enjoyed. Where Megan, what do you mean? Where is that a canon thing? Did Will write it? How did nobody tell me about this? Have you told me about this? This feels like it's ringing a faint bell, but I got to be honest, not a whole lot. Um, <laughs> Andy says, book, mem book one memories. I felt guilty about cheering for Lyndon beating up a bunch of eight-year-olds in a tournament. But what really grabbed me was Lyndon dying in book one to Lee Marcuth. Yeah, him being slapped in half. It's just such a humiliating death. And uh, and what I really loved about that, too, was how certain I was in the moment that it was going to do something. Like, he finds this secret technique that just works really well for somebody of his particular disability. And it's just overall feeling like we're setting up that he has the key to a weapon nobody else understands or nobody else would be able to use because they don't have his madra. And I'm really feeling like, oh, this is it. And so when he goes up to Lee Marcuth, I'm not necessarily thinking he's going to completely like take this man down, but I am thinking it's going to make any difference at all. 
I, I'm thinking it's going to do something. And he's dead before it quite registers how much of a complete failure it was. And that got me really surprised me. Um, Megan says it was part of an anthology. Oh, Andy says the anthology was heroes wanted. Oh, I should have read that for today. I wish I had known. Oh, well, what can you do? Um, Ooh, question from Asher down below. Besides Jai Long, because we all know how you feel about him. What character died that you are most upset about? What character died that you are most upset about? I'm trying to think of who, like, because not a lot of people that we like die. Most folks make it, you know? So I'm, I'm trying to even think who doesn't. And I can't even, like, pull anybody up in my head. Give me, give me a list, guys, of, of people who died in this series. Because everybody I'm thinking of are, are folks, like, from uh, Sacred Valley, which I feel like, fuck those people. Um, the, you know, I'm, I'm honestly not even thinking. I can't think of anybody. Who is somebody who died? Other than Jai Long... I mean, we have, uh, his grandfather died and we've got, oh, Asher is saying for me, it's a Kura Grace. She seemed really cool and I wanted more of her. Okay. So we've got that whole like crew, which makes me think actually Dodgy's brother. What was his name? Kuro? I can't remember. It was a K name though, wasn't it? I was so bummed about his death because he was just really sticking up for his brother and seeing that his father's treatment of his brother was spurring his brother to worse and worse behavior. So it felt for me like he was seeing the bad pattern that was being set into place. And he also understood that his father was kind of full of shit. And Kiro, thank you, McShard. Um, yeah, Kiro is like the kind of dude that I think would make a genuinely good ruler. And I also loved the fact that he was kind of into the woman who was obsessed with him with the uh, lifeline ability. But he recognized that the weird power imbalance between them made it sort of unethical for him to pursue anything with her, which is a real subtlety in understanding that I think a lot of characters, a lot of writers, frankly, wouldn't respect or understand. And it would be excusable by a lot of readers if that were simply unacknowledged and he went for her anyway, and it was seen as totally valid but i just really liked that his character was someone that seemed to grasp the psychology of people and care about it and it was such a tragedy to me that things were set in motion the way that they were and i will never really forgive charity for that because she was the one who set them against one another. And she did this in order to like force them into advancement so that she could have the best possible contestants for the, um, the tournament, which isn't a good enough reason to encourage these kids, which is what they were to low key fight to the death against one another like Akura Charity is actually a character that I find compelling and would like to know more about despite the fact that I don't really like her she is so removed in a way that feels dishonest like she doesn't want to admit how she feels about things to anybody and I understand that the advantage to that 
if people don't know what you're thinking or how you're feeling about certain things, they can't predict what move you're going to make. But with her, it never really felt like the kind of thing she was. It was all about for the advantage of the family and not because it was important to her personally. It was like, it just felt so directed by malice it felt like she was letting herself be controlled to a degree that I couldn't really respect. You know, it was always about ensuring that other folks didn't know if there was any discord between her and the family because of their reputation and needing to uphold this like united front. And I am just not somebody who respects loyalty that extends to people who haven't earned it or don't deserve it or are unethical people themselves. And they're just loyal because you're expected to be, and you have the same name I, that I can't get behind that. And I sort of was waiting for charity to get a little bit more redemption than she wound up with. And I'm not mad that she didn't get it just to be clear, because Frankly, the fact that she didn't, considering how she eventually did turn a corner and support Mercy and the crew against Malice, I think a lot of people see that as redemption. But in a lot of ways, it comes to me too little too late. You had all these like warnings along the way of what was really happening. And you chose not to listen, not to believe. And despite repeatedly being proven wrong about things and thinking that you knew what was best, you were shown how wrong you were over and over again. And you just weren't like willing to accept it. It just bothered me that she was so inflexible. And I still don't really understand if she is the sage of the silver heart, I don't really understand what that even means. Like, what does that icon signify? And how is it connected to her being so emotionless the way that she is? Not that she doesn't have emotion, but she doesn't show it. Um, let's see. Uh, Emic Shard says, I haven't reread Underlord recently. Andy says, I liked Renfe. I would have much preferred that by Roe be sliced in half by Harmony. There goes another one. And Mordecai up top is saying, I was surprised by the Skysworn guards we were just getting to feel better about. There goes another one. Um, just stuff that I would like more of. The Skysworn are pretty interesting. And I was into uh, What's His Face, who hated Aethon. I did find him so funny. His hatred of Aethon was really understandable to me. So it was hard for me to like even though he was a bigot really when it came to Lyndon and his friends I could get where he was coming from so it made it hard for me to hate him uh but yeah Ren Fei's not only the fact that she died but the way it's so casually done Harmony just didn't it it was just like him putting a finger to his lips to shush somebody but he sliced her in half like I, it's just so disrespectful. And it is really surprising to me that Byro doesn't show up again because we get that really tantalizing tidbit from Dross about how Byro's Madra feels gross. Like he describes it as, as almost like sewage or like rotting meat or something. And I don't think we ever get any further detail about what path he's on, what he's working with. And I am really, really curious about that. What is Byro's deal and where is he now? Because he was firmly against our friends and I would have enjoyed a lot to see him come back up in the story, facing down all of them now that they have gotten a lot more powerful and the difference in his attitude because we know that he's very observant of what's expected of him when he met Akura when he met Mercy he was like 
very respectful of her and, and almost overly so. So I'd be kind of curious about it, you know? Um, and McShard says, I want to know more about what kind of stuff Elder Whisper gets up to. <sighs> that would be pretty fun. Andy says, sitting in his tower eating fish. Yeah, at this point now, too, like, what is he up to now? Because his whole thing was basically being a mascot to the Way Clan. And if the Way Clan, you know, the boundary, the suppression field is no longer there. Does that affect his powers too? I have to assume it does. And if he was already a lot more powerful than them to begin with, has he continued to advance? Does he remain in this position of like almost a, of a God? I use the word mascot, but that feels pretty minimizing. I'm going to say, I'm trying to think of a good word for it because he's sort of a deity, but not exactly. But I, I just really wonder with the changes that happen due to the the Sacred Valley suppression field going down and everybody being exposed to the wider world and understanding the extent of all of, of the like different types of paths out there. Like they just in Sacred Valley, they thought you only could pursue one type of technique even. So what does the total sea change look like for somebody like him who had been at the very tippity top of the pyramid, you know? Um, Asher says, I think Charity had to close down her feelings because Malice was essentially her queen and Malice was so unforgiving. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I just have a really hard time because she never, her ambitions were not to like, go beyond sage. So she was reckon she had reconciled herself to staying in the position that she was in. And even when she found out the lies that she had been fed was prepared to maintain that position, you know, it's just hard for me when it seems so clearly unethical to see that she's like, well, I'll keep the secret. I mean, what else was she going to do? I guess she got forced into the soul loath. I don't know. I just feel like she could have done something more and she didn't. It wasn't until the very last moment, you know? Um, Andy says, I'd love a prequel book about the creation of the dread gods. Like how did they imprison subject one? What did the founder of the way clan do that pissed off Lee Mark so much? I forgot about that. And yeah, imprisoning subject one, like that whole thing, the creation of them would be really, really compelling. You could do it in either a, like just traditional story fashion, or you could have it be a sort of like historical text, which I think would also be kind of fun the way that um, like George R. R. Martin wrote the, uh, what is it called? It's the house of the dragon was based on fire and blood, right? I think, and fire and blood is a text that is supposed to exist in the song of ice and fire universe, readable by anybody who happens to have it and written from a sort of perspective of somebody who is assembling the histories that are available to them and putting them together into their best understanding of historical events that have transpired so long ago. There's no absolute witnesses left and they're just taking all of the different records that they can find and putting them together into the closest approximation of like a complete story that they can. And I think it'd be kind of fun if you handled it that way, where some of it's unclear, you know, a lot of it's like lost to history and you're working with suppositions and uh, maybe like names that are vaguely familiar or offer expanded backstory on characters we already know. Um, Emic Shard says, we don't know what level he is, but I think it's implied Whisper is somewhere in gold, but he also holds the Sword Sage's void space, which is icon touching stuff. I'm also very curious about this old fox. Yeah, understandable. Oh, there's questions at the bottom. Hold on, guys. I'm going to ask. Oh, so I, an I answered Asher's already. Uh, Megan has one. If you were in Cradle, what kind of path would you choose? 
it's so tricky because it's very tempting to approach it as if I were going to be in combat and answer the question like in what I think would be the most effective combat wise. And I don't think I would be in combat. Like if I'm going with my current personality, which is an entertainer, I would have to pick something that fits with that. Right. Or like, I don't know. I'm also thinking about um, the the series Mage Errant, which is written by someone who is friends with Will White. And he has what are called affinities, which is similar to like having a path of a certain type of Madra. But affinities are a, a bit more abstract even. And there is a scent affinity which is extremely helpful as a cook, but can also be used as a really effective weapon because you can mislead people using scents. You can cause them to basically go completely like they, they become unusable as soldiers. If you're causing them to throw up, which a bad enough scent could make people do if it's intense enough. Like it can be used for combat, but it can also be used creatively. And I like that, but I don't know what, how that works, you know, because like this universe, he's really, he brings up different paths that people have, but they're called by names that don't necessarily tell you what the madra is that they're using so it's it's sort of like tricky for me to even know what my options are um so yeah like my the scent one i like the idea of uh i oh god the thing that like i would really like is something that controls energy like being able to have more endurance because i just feel like i'm so low energy all the time it's like is there something that that can just make you happier can help with depression i'll have that path is there like a joy path that you just cultivate joy madra i would you sit outside like a comedy club and you just cultivate the aura of the people laughing inside and like i don't know but something to help me be less depressed would be great that would be my jam um so that's the best i can come up with i feel like i need this is what i need that compendium for megan you know i i had said before that i would love will to post to like create something that goes into detail about different paths and the techniques that go with those paths and the combinations of things that people can do and maybe later on in the book he goes into what folks who have split their cores manage to do because they have two paths now and that they can combine and make things that hadn't worked before um and then i would like to pick out of that and and decide on something from there um i will say I am fascinated by the, uh, what is the name of the, of the guy who Zeal was like sponsored by, who he was like a, a decent dude and he had that big mammoth with him and he dealt with animals a lot. Whatever his path that gave him like the affinity to talk with animals, that sounds pretty fun. As somebody who has been deeply enjoying despite all of its ups and downs, my experience with having dogs for the first time, I feel like animals would be a pretty fun one that would afford you a lot of opportunities to use it. And it could be used for all kinds of different things. Um, the beast King. Thank you. I'm shard. Yeah. I'd like to chat with the beast King. Talk about another character I'd like more of definitely would be interested in him. And I think that it was in the discord that somebody mentioned how initially will had been considering making zeal sort of a Pokemon trainer type where he was like, he relied on animals for a lot of his stuff. And he decided against doing that. And it feels like the beast King is him just having somebody way in the background that is a bit of that. So he gets it out of his system, but isn't so much in the forefront and isn't such like a parody of a thing. Um, but yeah, the beast master, the beast master, the beast King and 
Emrys. I would like more of those two. I also ship them, just for the record. I don't know if they're either of them are straight, but I'll ship them. Talk about a thing that I would like in the story, though. I would like a queer character. This is very straight series, which is kind of funny because some of these characters feel so gay to me. Like they just really, really do. And it's not at all on the page, even though in my opinion, it's super duper on the page. So I really wish that were more of a thing because like, come on, Ethan is fucking pan. I mean, give me a break. Ethan would fuck anybody. And it's funny because he's pretty sexless in the story itself. But that man fucks a lot. You cannot tell me that he does not. I'm sorry. He just does. It's just facts. And for me, Charity is gay. I just see Charity as a lesbian. Don't have anything to base that on. She just is, though. She's, she just is. And I feel like I could go through all kinds of characters with this, you know, just be like, yeah, I've, Mercy's bi. She just, I don't know. She's just bi. There it is. Uh, Pride is straight. Lyndon's straight. Yaren, I feel like, is bi. She seems just sort of flexible in that way, you know. Uh, Zeal. I'm going to put Zeal as ace. He just <laughs> Part of that's coming from, and this is like no shade to ace people, but there's a feeling from Zeal of just like, he just wouldn't be bothered. I don't see him getting into anything with anybody. He'd just be like, I mean, you're very cool and all, but no, I'm tired. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, sorry. I'm going up here a little bit because I missed some stuff. Um, Andy says, in a prequel, we'd get to see a younger Red Faith. Ooh, he's repulsive, but fascinating. Actually, forget about a single prequel. I want a prequel trilogy. Yeah, there's so much like there really is. There's so much more he could do with this if he wanted. I get why he doesn't. And I'm not like mad at him for it. But if he chose, he could really go into a whole other series and it would work. Um, and let's see. Asher says, Ethan is the gayest. Before the story shipped him with Kelsa, Jai Long read gay to me. Oh, interesting. I guess I could see that. Hmm. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, Zeal as ace is absolutely correct. Ace person speaking. Hey, me and Asher on the same page. Um, but yeah, that's the only thing that I would really, really love if we could get Will to be a little bit less straight because, you know, people of, it's just funny to me too. I know that like, this isn't necessarily everybody's experience. So for some folks out there listening who this isn't their experience, they're going to be like, not getting where I'm coming from. But I have a circle of friends in which I am like, almost the only straight person all of my friends are bi or gay or just queer i have a lot of friends who are trans which that doesn't have to do with sexuality but that is still like you know falling outside of our cultural norms and i as the straight cis woman am the outlier and i just it's I'm so surrounded by queer people that when I am in a story that completely lacks any queerness, it feels weird now because it's just such an accepted part of the world I live in that it feels really obvious when it's being left out of something. It's almost like you had to put effort into leaving it out, which I know isn't necessarily true because there's a lot of people who are surrounded by other straight folks, cis folks, and they don't have that kind of circle. And so for them, it doesn't occur to them because they're just not, you know, and I, I totally understand that, but I also feel like you, that's also kind of on you and maybe it's a little bit your fault. 
Like if your if your circle doesn't include a lot of people who fall outside this like one category, I feel like maybe you should just examine why that is. And is it possible that maybe some do and they just don't feel safe telling you? Is it possible that you just don't seem like a welcoming person? Just, you know, just it's that's not necessarily true, but I would examine it. I would ask because I truly I can't think of a single close friend of mine that is straight. Yeah, I really can't. Everybody that I'm like the closest with, they're all somewhere on the spectrum of queerness. I'm the only one. And I've questioned that a lot. But I just, I'm just straight. I'm just real boring. <laughs> anyway, um, and McShard says, Mercy definitely feels bi to me. My ship was Linden and Yer and realizing they both think she's really cute and letting a bi slash poly trio exist. I, I like that idea. Just the poly, especially if it were just sort of like on again, off again, you know, like occasionally they're like, ah, oh, I'm in the mood for a little treat. Hey, Mercy, what you doing? <laughs> you up? But also that Mercy has like her own whole thing going on. I also really like Malice having a uh, harem and it's described as just all dudes, which is fine. But, you know, if Malice had a chick in there here and there, why not? I feel like Malice is so into power. I feel like she would be pan just because she wants power over anybody. And that's how she views sex also. So to me, that just reads as she's all inclusive but not because she's like open minded. It's because she's kind of fucked up. Um, and let's see. Uh, Epic Shard, as a queer person, we have a tendency to flock or swarm. <laughs> I don't know why that got me so bad, but that really is funny. Swarm. Uh, Evil says. So soon we forget about Akura Shuri. She was into zeal and he noticed. I genuinely do not remember who that is. I genuinely don't. Um, Evil says just having friends does not mean someone can automatically write a queer character correctly. See, I always find that interesting because like you just write a, a person and then you just throw in they're attracted to somebody it doesn't like there's nothing different about writing a queer character versus another character you just make them a person the way you would make a straight person and then you just have them not be straight like you know what i'm saying like i i get that there are some some territories you want to be careful about but also there comes a point where it's like a char like them being queer doesn't have to be what their character is about. In fact, I would encourage it not to be what their character is about. Um, and again, if you're interested in a lot more queer representation in a, a well-written fantasy storyline, Mage Aaron, he is gay as hell. Like those stories, they're full. There's straight couples for sure, but there's a lot of queer rep and it's, very funny. He had like a one star or two star review on the book that I had just finished reading on Audible. And the guy said something about how these books are too gay. At first I was like, maybe it's fine. But then it got gayer and I was like, ugh. And I screenshot it and posted it on Twitter. And the author replied and said, every time I get a review like this, I push a button in my head that says make it gayer. And I was just like, now see, here's the energy. That's what I'm looking for. Um... MX Shards says, if I recall, they had the I'm not an Archlord, of course, Archlord interaction. Oh, I only barely remember that. Um, Evil says that's just pandering. Then the fact that you think having queer characters is pandering is weird. Like, it's just weird. Just having characters who are not of one type is not pandering and as asher says what's wrong with a little pandering like even if it were but it it's simply not it's just acknowledging that people exist beyond this one type and that's not pandering that's just reality um 
Megan says, Will seems to dislike slash be uncomfortable writing romance. I kind of got that impression also. Like, it, he has, it, it feels like he kind of is this way with the other series he wrote also. He just doesn't really include it too much. And when he does, it's just sort of the one main romance. And he doesn't have a lot going on on the sides. Like, and, and even the one main romance will be sort of sexless. It's very chaste, you know. Um, <laughs> evil. Not ha No, just having, making them and not doing anything with them is pandering. It's a checkbox. Who's not doing anything with them? Evil, you're arguing a, a, a position here that nobody's made. You're arguing against a hypothetical you made up. I don't know what you're even talking about. I'm talking about just having characters be attracted to different genders. And you're acting like I'm just telling him to make up a queer character and stick it in the story for no reason. Nobody said that. Nobody is talking about that. Like you're just creating the scenario for yourself. I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's not worth arguing about because I have my stance on this and Anybody, in my opinion, who thinks having queer characters in a story is anything other than an organic choice to make because those people exist, in my opinion, has some real internal work to do and needs to take some real looks at their viewpoints on some things. Because I just feel like it's so natural. I would so include that in stories simply because those are my friends that the idea that it's done simply to appease people that's a, that's your problem if you feel like that's what you're doing as a writer that's your problem if you feel like that's what a writer is doing as a reader that's your problem these people exist and they deserve to be in stuff end of story like genuinely i don't even know what the, there is to argue about here it's just such a silly thing. It's like arguing about somebody just doesn't include any of the color blue in their descriptions of colors in the story. And you're like, well, you know, writing the color blue would be really difficult. <laughs> like, what? They just, the blue, color blue just exists. It has existed. It exists now. And not including it just is weird. It's fucking very basic. Um. <laughs> Asher. It's like that reporter asking George Martin how he writes women so well and him responding that he's always seen women as people. There you go. Yeah. It's just, I don't know. People, uh, people want things to be more complicated than they are to excuse the fact that they don't feel like exercising their brains or their empathy. And I'm kind of tired of it. Like, I feel like we've really reached a point where there's no excuse anymore. Like, get over yourself. <laughs> yeah, I'm just not interested in these sorts of debates people exist and they are human beings just like anybody else who should be allowed to exist fully with representation in stories and it not be an an argument that i have to have like get out of here with that shit anyway this is really circling back around to will can you make some statements because you know combined with the whole Hogwarts thing, I just have some feelings and I want to cover these. I really desperately do. Um, Andy says someone needs to show Jim Butcher that quote. Oh God, <sighs> you guys, I will never get over. And I know that I like lost my mind during the episode when I recorded with Rashawn. I can't remember which book it is, but he walks into an office with a secretary and he describes all of this expensive furniture. And then he gets to describing the secretary and he literally writes, she was just as beautiful as every other object in the room. And I, I like screamed and put the book down for a second and was just like, did he really? And I went back and checked it again and like, yeah, yeah, he sure did. <laughs> Like, what are you thinking? Oh, God. Um, 
Andy says, man, I'd love to get Rashawn's take on this series. Same. Everybody lobby Will to, like, make a statement. For real. Just dude. You know? I gotta know. Um, but... Anyway, I just, I really, really enjoyed this. I can't wait. I'm going to wait a little bit probably. And then I'm going to go back and do a reread from beginning to end. I'm sure it's going to be really fun. And I, the only thing that I can hope is that my coverage helped to bring some other people to the series that might not have checked it out. Otherwise, I've talked about it so much on other things that I've covered just as an aside. And of course, I announced we were going to cover it before taking it back. And I think I said that on a few things as well. So I'm hoping that uh, it's that I've helped a little bit in getting some more attention on it. But also, like, Andy has definitely, like, Will owes you some money, Andy, <laughs> because you just put down so much. I mean, there were 12 books that Andy had to pay for, and they got longer and longer. And every time, Andy was just like, yeah, how much? And just wrote a check and was like, yeah, do it. Every time, no matter how long the damn book was. This time around, he was like, oh, extra, extra episode? It's fine. Keep it. So Will really should like send you some flowers or something at minimum, Andy. Um, oh, Megan says you're the reason I read it. Mordecai says same here. Asher says me too. Yay. I love that. Uh, <laughs> Mordecai says I heard sassy giant turtle and was like, I must read. I vaguely remember saying that. Yeah, that was a good time. Ah, oh, Orthos. What a delight. I wouldn't mind some more about Serpent's Graves history. That too would be interesting. You know, the whole way that went down, especially since it's been mentioned, like probably Ethan named it. And I know we've seen, we've gotten plenty about Ethan's past, but I would like to see some things written from other people's perspective who knew Ethan. What did they think of him? You know, because he seemed like such a dick, but he was also able to back it up, which is the most terrible type. Somebody who's an asshole for valid reasons, the worst. Like, what do you even do, you know? And we've gotten to know him since he became a lot more, like, self-aware. And so his irritating qualities are also kind of delightful. But what was he like when there was nothing mitigating that? Even the, the echoes that we saw of him where he is so arrogant, we have the comfort of knowing now he is not like that. We have the comfort of knowing that he grew, but people didn't have that. I just, I don't know. Very curious. Very curious. Anyway. All right, kiddos. Um, I am over time, but I figure if you're going to be over time for any of these, the final one is the one to do it. I really, I am just hoping that there will be another series that like scoops me up like this eventually. And I think one of my greatest achievements is having gotten Owen to start reading them because I knew he would love them. And it took a lot of tries. He wasn't like hearing me at first. He was in a place where like, I don't know about y'all, but starting something new can be hard when you are neurodivergent and if you're listening to the same things over and over, watching the same things for comfort, somebody's suggesting a new thing. You're just kind of like, yeah, once I get done with my like 75th rewatch of The Office, I'll get right on that. And he was sort of in that place when I tried to get him. And then eventually he did the first one and that was it. And it has been really fun to share this with him as well. Um, so I hope that one day maybe we'll get to see this on the screen and I can only hope they do it properly. That's my only, you know, I would love that, but they better not fuck it up. <sighs> they will. I guess I'll just have to, I'll, I'll watch it anyway. Who am I kidding? All right, everybody. Thank you again so much. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Will. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.
Unspoiled Network Podcast.